No. That's it. <laughs> OK. Good evening. Um, so you may know me from such movies as CF Engine and Home Improvements or Promise Theory, How to Get Rich. Uh, those of you who know my work, you know that I've been involved in configuration management for a long time and have been sort of opinionated about the theory behind it as well as the practice of it. What I want to talk to you about tonight is a slightly different topic. Uh, let me start this here. Trust, data, and microservices. How many of you would say that you uh, are involved in some way in microservices? Ah, practically everybody. Uh, which is a pretty interesting development because uh, this is a relatively new topic, and yet it's sort of taken the world by storm. I think that, that uh, the subject has some deep implications about the way not only do we make software, but about the kinds of questions that we can ask about systems in general. And what I want to try and unpick a little bit this evening is uh, what are some of those consequences. And some of them have to do with data, the ability to observe data, ask questions to probe systems, and really find out what's going on in systems. And it turns out that there are principles that apply here that are not just to do with computer systems. They also have to do with any kind of network, any kind of system, including you know, all the way up to society. So you know, as we look for ways to scale human effort and share resources, we build these platforms of, for, for sharing. Um, and we tend to wrap the components of these uh, systems in services with boundaries around them and think of them as independent entities that, that collaborate together. It's a form of modularity. Modularity, of course, is almost a doctrine in computer science. If you say anything against modularity, you're considered to be a, a raving nutter. Uh, I might be one of those raving nutters because I have some, some negative things to say. It's not all positive about modularity. Um, modularity crops up in organizations, in logic, in data processing through batching and accumulation, aggregation of data and so on, statistics. So it's a topic with huge implications. Um, you know, that spans from what it means to have a democracy to detecting particles at CERN. Huge implications. Uh, mostly we're gonna see a lot of activity around microservices to do, now to, today we're looking at these things like the service mesh which give us a way of interacting between these isolated, so-called isolated components. And we realize that they're maybe not as isolated as, as we like to think of them. But this is something that I want to try to unpick a bit this evening. So, um, we've come to this sort of problematic watershed in computer science, I would say. In the past, we believed in things like determinism, right answers, you know, the correct outcome. We believe that the machines were the right answer, the correct outcome was literally programmable. There was no uncertainty, there was no doubt. Doubt was something that belonged to engineering, physics, you know, those old fashioned sciences, biology. But computer science, this is true or false. There is no in between. Observation, on the other hand, when we try to uh, figure out what's going on in a system, is a thorny issue altogether. It comes from, um, it may you know, be about a world of machines right now, but every time we make a measurement, this adds to our uncertainty about what the correct answer is. You know, the classic old uh, adage that if you have one clock, you know what time it is. If you have two, you're not sure. This scales up to the, to the uh, uh, the kind of processes where we count votes in states to see who got elected president, for instance. And we know that when we take a representative result based on a count, we have to make a decision about whether we think the outcome voted for one candidate or another, or whether the, you know, in other words, whether it's the answer true or was it false? Was it blue, red, or green? You know, what exactly was the outcome of a measurement? This is not a simple question. And in order to make those measurements, we sort of have to trust in the process that gathers the data. 
So we have to believe that the, the process has access to be able to count, and we have to believe that it uh, preserves, in some sense, the essence of what it's measuring without necessarily counting every single bit of data. Because there may be an infinite amount of data we could collect. How, when do we know how to stop? We have to stop at some point. How does that happen? Um, so the hardest problem, in a sense, that society faces is, is how to batch things into boundaries, how to draw a boundary around something and say that this is an acceptable thing to study and it has an outcome that we can measure by, observ by observing it. Uh, if you look at all the modern technologies, we have things like everything from database consistency to blockchains, all trying to do a version of this in some sense using totally different strategies. And yet this is a really core problem in, in the industry. So it turns out that our technological objectives for infrastructure, which involve putting boundaries around things, may be in conflict with our desire to know what's going on inside them. Because if we draw a boundary, we then have to ask how can we get through the boundary to see and to count what's inside it. And does that boundary interfere with the knowledge that we can have about the system in some way. So this has to do with scale as well as boundaries. Now, I gave a talk somewhat like this uh, last year at Reactive Summit, and I went into a lot more detail about microservices. If any of you are interested in more about that, then look up the old uh, talk last year from Reactive Summit. What I wanted, the point that I wanted to make, and this is one of the slides that I used, is that what we mean by scale and modularity, uh, sorry, what we mean by modularity is scale dependent. It's not entirely clear whether something is a monolith or whether it's a bunch of microservices. Monoliths, monolith of course means big stone. Uh, we look at this city, we can imagine it as a kind of a monolith. From a distance, if you're approaching a city, it looks like this large monolithic singular entity because it's surrounded by a bunch of countryside, which is not, like, not similar, and then there's something that sticks out. So it's something that stands out against its background. That's what we mean by monolithic. But now you imagine you're an invading army coming to attack this city. From a distance, it looks like a monolith, but as you get closer and closer, it looks less and less monolithic. You might start to meet some people who've come out of the city and, and, and ask them where they're from. Oh, we belong to the city. So part of the city is now sort of a cloud around it. And as you get closer, you can see that it's made of all kinds of people. And as you attack, you realize that there's a whole army of people firing arrows one by one. And that each one is an independent actor, and it's executing an independent process. And so each one is a kind of little microservice. And yet they all somehow work together. So at what point is this monolith really to be seen as a bunch of smaller services? And at what scale is it appropriate to view this system as an entity or as a collection of smaller things? I think one of the answers to this is, is related to the boundary. We have to remember that boundaries are not physical things usually. They are related to some kind of a property or a promise. I like to use the term promise because it's easy to understand. You may have people who promise to be part of the city and people who promise to be from outside. That's a virtual boundary. It's not a physical boundary because the people may be spread all around, but people can make a decision whether they're inside or outside. Are you one of us or are you one of them? Similarly, with any kind of boundary that we draw in a computer system, we can say, are we inside this module or are we outside this module? And this notion of modularity or boundary is therefore associated with a particular kind of promise. I might be inside because I'm inside the building, but I'm outside because I don't belong to VMware. So you see the notion of being inside or outside and the notion of boundaries is a fluid thing which depends on the semantics that we're thinking about. This is not the way we think in infrastructure. In infrastructure, we try to build solid walls and we try to associate the semantics with those walls. We build firewalls. We build uh, data centers where the geographic location of things is associated with the semantics themselves. 
But now in the world of virtualization, this is no longer really true. And we have to think again. So when we talk about uh, scaling, we think of uh, separating things for, for their protection. We like to have boundaries for security. We like to think of dynamic, isolating things dynamically. So we can't see what happens inside the boundary. So for isolation, we think of separation of concerns, logical separation. I don't care about the details on the inside. I just care about what promises the thing makes on the outside. But what about the outcome? Does the nature of the outcome from some process for some module uh, depend on the scale as well? And this is, I think, is an important question that we have to confront in the age of virtualized containers, virtualized processes, data collected from literally you know, sensors all across the planet. The idea of the physical boundary is no longer really important to us. But the notion of the virtual boundary certainly is. And we need to know how to count. So here's an example of how we draw boundary. Uh, and I tried to make this look a little bit like the castle. So on the left-hand side, I've drawn a picture of what really amounts to a, micro, uh, a monolith in the, sense, in the software sense. And on the right-hand side, you see how really uh, a kind of a microservice point of view really just is a, re way, a way of redrawing this picture. So in the monolith, we have a bunch of developers, the M in the middle, sort of writing the code. You've got a bunch of, oh, sorry, the Ps for the, the developers, the programmers are the Ps. Uh, P's in the pod. <laughs> uh, the monolith is somehow in the middle, which is the code, right? So the code that gets written, that might be a GitHub repository. And you've got a bunch of testing going on along the side. These are all separate individuals, se separate agents. And then on the outside of some boundary, you've got some users. And we think of the monoliths really as being the code. You know, when developers talk about monolith, they, they mean the code usually. Correct me if I'm wrong later. And the developers are somehow outside of this, and they work on the monolith. And the testing, again, works on the monolith from outside. In microservices, we just do a kind of a phase transition, and we mix it all up. We say, now instead of separating those things, those, those separate logical things, and drawing boundaries around them based on the promise of their role, we're going to draw boundaries around them based on collaborations. So we create these little pizza teams where you have a number of developers working on a particular module. And the testers are very close to them. And they're all, they, draw, they can all draw a boundary around themselves and say, we are a unit. And then each developer is related to a particular module. And we just drew, sort of mix it all up. And now we've just, all we've done, it's exactly the same actors, exactly the same promises. We've just redrawn how we believe the boundaries are or where they are. So actually, the microservice and the monolith, they aren't that different. It just depends how you choose to look at it. The reason, of course, that we do this is that developers have a cognitive limitation. They, can't, they don't like to look at too much code at a, at a time. And so this nice story came out of Netflix and other companies about having dedicated programmers for each module. The problem is that in most companies, they don't have that number of programmers. So it's the same programmers working on all the same modules. So actually, these things aren't as separate as they look. These are simply roles. And we understand these diagrams as only promises made by certain, certain virtual entities. They're not, it's not a real representation of how the system works. Let us also remember, if any of you are laboring under the uh, mis um, misunderstanding that these are somehow security barriers, that there are all kinds of covert channels between these different entities, out-of-band things, phone conversations, text messages, et cetera, et cetera. So this is in no way a model of security. And yet we often present it as such when we talk about microservices. So one of the things I think that's important about this is not how we choose to call it, whether it's a monolith or a microservices, but where the promise boundaries go. In other words, what promises are being made between which individuals? 
how we scale infrastructure has a lot to do with this, from all the way from the mainframe up to the modern day service mesh, if you like. So how does a computer really scale? It's about how we can deal with uh, resources often, how we share out resources. And the resources are really just one of the many promises that you can have in the system. I have memory, I have CPU. Um, I have uh, computational ability, you know. And we've scaled uh, computer systems from the beginning to today through an incredible number of boundaries that we, that we, where we've chosen to view things as being monolithic or service-like, depending upon the age in which we were living. You know, we st computers started out as LCR circuits, essentially, uh, and then we made them into transistors, we made switches, the switches turned into breadboard circuits, you know, all this kind of improvisation. It all looks kind of like um, a bunch of independent components wired together by services. So in the beginning, when it's all kind of messy, it looks like microservices. Small components joined together by wiring. But then as we get, become more sophisticated, we integrate them vertically because it's more efficient. So we have VLSI. And then we put those together into computers and we wire the computers into a network and suddenly it looks messy again, all wires going all over the place. And then we put them into a data center and tidy away the wires so it looks like it's, it's integrated again. And now it looks tidy and we think it's monolithic again. But then inside the computer we have this monolithic software and we break it up into little pieces and we have all the wiring exposed again because you have to open a socket to each program and we've exposed all the wiring and, and, and created a lot of mess for programmers to deal with. So we do this all the time. This is nothing new. And so going back to the original point, let's just rethink the way we look at systems and not think about monolith versus microservice. It's irrelevant. What's important is, is to what extent we choose to see the wiring or not by drawing some kind of a virtual boundary around something. This is nothing more than procedural programming, putting things inside functions. This is how we absorb stuff into infrastructure. But what we need to do, of course, is to then make things cooperate together, which requires trust. Now, sort of in defense of monoliths, let me just point out an example that comes from sociology. Way back in the 60s and 70s, there was a, a, a city movement, a town planning movement called the Garden City Movement. Very common uh, to see this in South America, in Brasilia, for, for example, where people tried to tidy up cities by um, planning, the, mo planning them in a modular way. Here we will have the shopping, here we'll have the central business district, here we'll have the residential areas. And they separated all of these things so it looked beautiful and tidy. We love tidiness in computer science, right? But it was a total failure because what happened was that everybody ended up sitting in traffic. Everybody needs to go to work at the same time, everybody lives in the same place, they're all in a car trying to go from one part of town to the next on the same road and they end up with exactly the problem we have in computing, which is that the network becomes the bottleneck. So why not redraw these boundaries and make it more efficient? How would we do that? What would it look like? Well, my favorite example is um, your average Chinatown. This is a picture of Hong Kong. Any of you have been to Hong Kong or even you know Chinatown in most large cities, it's kind of chaotic, it's kind of messy. Everything is all packed together in a tiny space. It looks like a bunch of neurons interacting you know, uh, on top of each other, it's like a brain. Uh, it's not like a nice tidy garden city collection of modules, but it's so efficient. It's economically prosperous, Everyone, no one has to go very far because everything is in, within arm's reach and it's buzzing, it's alive, it's vibrant, it's all of those things. But if you scale out Hong Kong, if you zoom up into the air with your drone, all you see is an island. And it's just like a brain 
from a large distance looks like a blob. It's a monolith. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, it's a chaotic, mixed up kind of network with very few modules. Okay, the brain has a few modules, but not that many. So nearly all data processing tries to do this in a different way. Because we believe in this doctrine of modularity in IT, we try to batch data into, into um, comfortable blobs, if you like, comfortable regions. We try to modularize functions into servers, into services, perhaps uh, scaled somewhat through pods and, and other abstractions. But ultimately, we're generally obsessed by the semantics of the story rather than the dynamics of it. And by that I mean, we're not too concerned about how the, the amounts, the, the quantitative uh, variables scale. We focus a lot on whether we understand. And this, of course, is the point about cities. The garden city might be easy to understand. It's easy to draw a map of it. It's easy to plan. But the, the messy city, the chaotic city that's really hard to draw and to understand is the one that works better when it comes down to it. We still need to learn that lesson in, in IT. So there may be a loss of clarity when we start aggregating things together, but this is efficient. Do any of you work with data processing? Uh, big data, analytics, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. These are all sort of common uh, things that we're starting to use a lot of now, right? The whole division of being able to use data. And data are basically a big messy blob coming out of the world like your Chinatown. But we want to try to turn it into something modular, something some, like, like a summary of something that we can ident identify, a pattern that we can identify and recognize. Um, the reason is, I mean, the fundamental reason is that when we aggregate things into nice blobs, we see the stability of it. We see something that doesn't change too much. It looks recognizable. When we see chaos, we don't recognize it except that it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of information. So it's a strategy for understanding, in a sense. And this is in, this is in uh, conflict with the desire to understand to, to actually see what's going on. If you think about in the third world, in the developing world, we see a lot of shanty towns filled with all kinds of random places with all kinds of services going on. What we do when we build a city is we refactor all of that complexity and we try to modularize it. So we try to absorb housing, transportation, uh, insulation, and all of the themes on the left-hand side, we try to rebuild them in a more comprehensible uh, interaction model, uh, like a set of clearly defined service interfaces on the right-hand side. This is our strategy in IT. But this strategy is confounded by uh, the scale. As it gets bigger and bigger, it gets harder and harder to make that simple transition to simplicity again. Because if you try to scale this, double it, treble it, quadruple it, gang, times it by 10, and suddenly the city is, looks more like the left-hand side again. So it's only when it's monolithic, it's only when you've got these monolithic tower-like structures that it really makes semantic sense to us. And this is a basic conflict in the way that we design systems. One of the things that we're forced to do because of uh, scaling is to build systems that are focused on the time scales. And we've been basically rising up this, this, this graph here, this picture, uh, for the past 20, 30 years. Processes that we have to deal with uh, have been getting faster and faster. So back in the old days, we had to make cha planning changes to systems on the time scale of months or days. Um, as uh, and then, of course, there are processes like uh, computation, which go at the level of seconds, milliseconds, microseconds. Everything's getting faster. But when we get to a certain speed, humans can no longer be involved in the process because we are scale fixed, right? We can't speed up our brains. 
We can build technology faster, but we can't speed up our brains. So if humans are going to be coupled into the system, that's a cognitive limitation, and humans will uh, pin a scale that the system has to respond to. This, incidentally, is a problem for microservices, because microservices have been designed to, be, to fit inside a, a person's head. This is the, the justification for microservices. Each one should fit inside a single person's head. But when they don't, it all falls apart. And the limitation of having it fit inside a single person's head is that you have additional complexity uh, forcing connections between small things, which actually is more complex than the monolith that you're possibly replacing. But all of this is getting faster and faster. And so we see you know, the way we manage systems goes through stages. It used to be we would make manual changes to the system. We still do it for things like DNS, records, and so on. And then when things have to scale out and we need to, to make changes on time scale of minutes or seconds, then we need something like Puppet or Chef or CF Engine or one of these automation tools. And then getting faster and faster, those tools no longer can respond fast enough either. So we need a new platform, something like infrastructure as a service, something like uh, Mesos or um, VMware, <laughs> Docker, virtualization, automation process, and so on. And this whole thing is shifting upwards. And it's shifting upwards, leaving behind the human scale. I drew this AT uh, line in the middle, which is kind of the... The, AT, uh, the, the HT boundary, the human uh, boundary, if you like, beyond which we can't think faster or we can't act faster, which is about you know, a second or something like that. If it's faster than a second, we, we need to get out of the way because the system just, uh, you know, we're slowing the system down. Now, this is fine for technology. Um, but we still need to understand the components because we're still involved in building them and trusting them, right? The, the, the relationship is not only that we build something and deploy it, but there are also users who are humans who are making use of these processes. They also have cognitive limitations, and they need to understand the systems at whatever level they interact with them. Increasingly, we're being forced into understanding the technical systems through APIs because in our modern world we're exposing all kinds of API services to build layers and layers of technology. So as we, we build technological depth, we're also pinning scales around human consumers which limit the extent to which we can trust them. We can't get enough data about them. We can't understand them. They're going too fast. They're too complicated. We can't, cons you know, we can't build a mental model of it anymore. And so we have this fundamental problem between making infrastructure, making systems in terms of modules, and being able to see inside them, being able to trust what they do. Do we try to probe into them, or do we just accept them on trust? Don't forget... And this is something that I mention uh, specifically because of things like blockchain, which claim to be trustless systems. Trust is what happens when you don't verify something, right? Trust is not about applying every possible test to make sure that, you, that the system does what it says. That's verify. Trust is what you do when you don't do that. You say, okay, I just believe you now. It's a belief. Um, and it's a scaling issue. It's a cost-saving issue. Trust is to save cost. We trust our friends. We don't verify everything that they do because it's just too much work. We can go a lot faster when we can trust. This is why we introduced centralized institutions like banks and governments in the first place. Instead of having to build a trust relationship with every individual we do business with, we can just build a relationship with the bank. If we trust the bank, then we know that when we pay the money in there, they will take care of the payment for us. We don't have to you know, do the N squared um, problem of, of maintaining trust with everybody if we can centralize it. So the, the introduction of monoliths were incredibly important things in society, 
for scaling trust. And in the same way, every time we build a module, every time we build a, a boundary in a system, we are doing it to build a form of trust, which we don't want to verify the details of. But this gives us a problem about seeing inside, because knowledge, what we believe we trust about a system, is based on interactions over time. If you meet somebody for the first time, you never met them before, and they, off, and they ask you if you can borrow $100, you probably wouldn't trust them, because you don't have enough history. But as you interact with them again and again over time, you build up knowledge of their patterns of behavior, and you understand how they're likely to behave in certain circumstances, this is what we call learning. It doesn't have to be machine learning. We can still do it with our brains, right? But it's learning. It's the accumulation of experience over time by interaction. That's knowledge. So we have to have a long-term investment in a, an interaction in order to build trust, which means there has to be a certain stability of the system over time in order for us to build up that knowledge. This is something that we are eroding through infrastructure sharing. So when we build systems like cloud, we're spinning up, spinning down containers, not building long-term history, collecting a few data points and pouring it into some Kafka log or, or something like this. We may be collecting data, but we're not collecting data about the same thing anymore. We're collecting data about a lot of random similar things which are not entirely the same. And our ability to understand that, to identify what it is that we're trusting, is now being scattered around the system in all directions. This is really the, the problem that we're facing with cloud today. Uh, I like this picture just because it kind of shows how systems evolve in terms of uh, commercial activity. Well, when we start doing something, whatever it is, whether it's a startup or, or farming, we get involved with our hands because humans like to be involved uh, fixing things. Eventually, it becomes too much work. We build machines to help us. And we build machines that do it in sort of imitating the way that humans would do it. And then we realize, actually, the way humans would do it is limited by human scale. We don't need to be limited by that. We can just redesign the whole thing, take humans totally out of the loop, and make it look like something else altogether and make it very efficient. So in a hydroponics lab, for instance, in a hydroponics farm, you've just reprogrammed space and time to grow plants, totally without human intervention. It's all fully automated, and it's way more efficient. But you walk in there, it's kind of hard to understand what's going on. We don't see the processes because they're not on the human scale anymore. This is sort of the fate of computer systems. If we, if we want to scale computer systems, they will end up looking like this. I mean, it already looks like a data center, right? Um, and yet, we cling on to this picture on the left-hand side because we, we want to be involved. So we're always having this tension between this monolithic interaction on the left-hand side because we are human and this microservice interaction on the right-hand side in which humans have been exercised completely from the system. But now compare this to what we're doing in computer science now, where we're building microservices around humans. So we're embedding humans in every plant pot. You know, we're, <laughs> we're putting a little micro farmer inside every plant pot to, to, to manage each module independently. This is not really the scalable way to do it. This, on the right-hand side, is VLSI for farming. And that's really where we're going to come back to. I think, personally, and I've said this many, many times before in talks, Mahesh was saying I was controversial, so let me be a bit controversial. Um, I think that microservices, as we understand them today, are a temporary aberration in the history of software. The next thing is that we'll develop a language that will span infrastructure, will allow us to program space and time, essentially, um, 
to compute the things that we want without human in intervention. There will be a language that can cope with the purpose of this, and it will compile into all of those interactions that we're currently managing through pizza teams, having meetings with other pizza teams to design an API, and then calling them up, and all of that overhead. So there's really no way around that. But there's an important point here as well, and that is that when you draw these boundaries around systems, you don't really see into them very clearly. And you can build a system that reasons based on data collection, but if your data collection is compromised by the very structures that you've used to build the software, how can you trust the conclusions that you come to? How do you know, if you say, if you have some code that says, if data value that I computed greater than threshold that I decided, then do such and such, else do something else, you've got like a knife edge, a threshold, above threshold, below threshold, totally different behaviors in your program. And this is an instability. Because if you're not able to measure that condition in a stable manner, if it depends on the scale at which you look at the system or the scale at which you've instantiated your service, how can you possibly trust that if-then-else statement to give a stable answer or a predictable outcome? Are you really reasoning or are you just creating an instability? That's why I spend a lot of time when, when talking about promise theory or promises in computers, trying to get people to understand that it's the uncertainties in systems that we need to address. And the design goal of a system that we can rely on, that we can trust, if you like, is stability. We build aircraft for, like the 747, to fly basically in a straight line. It's predictable, straightforward, we totally understand it. It's not at all exciting. We don't want excitement when we're taking plane. We build fighter jets to dodge missiles, turn on a penny, you know, fly loops or whatever. We definitely don't want to do that if we're building a service out of it. That's a totally different model. But if we're building business services, society services, uh, commerce, you want that stability of the 747. We're compromising that through the kinds of models that we're trying to, to build now. A very important thing that we do all the time now in data analysis is to what we call dimensional reduction. You pour a whole lot of information like that crazy Hong Kong picture into a neural net or a big data analysis thing and you classify it into a number of outcomes, cat, dog, human, virtual machine. You know, you pour a whole lot of images in it and it will identify what it is. So you've gone massive number of possible variations into four possible variations, dimensional reduction. Now we should be, start to see that how you do that, the process by which that happens, is a potentially unstable process, which will depend on the way that you draw boundaries around the lumps of data, the sources of the data, and exactly how you piece that together. When we isolate a program inside a Docker container, we've cut it off from the larger pattern of traffic that we used to be able to look at to see the patterns of user behavior. We can no longer see that. Every signal that that container sees looks like an anomaly because you can't see the big picture anymore. This is a problem if you're trying to collect data and understand the behavior of the service as a whole. Similarly, if you're not allowed to talk to your neighbor because you have weird security practices in your company, you can no longer see the big picture about your company and understand its sort of mission statement or something. Scaling has critical importance on not only um, how fast things go or how big things can get, but actually on the semantics, the interpretation of what you can say about them, whether you determine something to be true or whether something turns out to be false. So we have this sort of you know, very black and white dichotomy 
which just no longer makes sense to us on a statistical basis. This made sense when you literally had a, a tiny number of states that you could distinguish. They were countable. When they're not countable, they start to become um, ambiguous. If these circles represent the scale at which you're looking at the system or interacting with the system, and you say, Is, am I measuring true, false, or some other value? Well, the circle on the top left is just white, so maybe that's true. The circle, the big blue circle, contains black and white uh, and yellow. Oh no, what's this? Suddenly we've even got a point that doesn't fit into black and white anymore. And actually there are almost as many whites and blacks, so can we say it's true or false? Or what, what's going on here? How do we even ask the question true or false anymore? Trying to visualize the problem that we face every day in monitoring systems and trying to comprehend them through digital measurements as we scale them up and down, as we probe them over different time scales and different uh, spatial scales, if you like, or, or instance scales. The simple ability to say, to distinguish between true and false melts away because it just becomes a lot more complicated than that. This is going to affect the way that we uh, draw conclusions in AI, in machine learning, in analytics. Um, the problem of inference, if you like, causation about what causes something else, the origin of a particular outcome, the reason we chose a particular path in a program, all of this is now vulnerable to scale. This is something that we have to confront, and we're not really starting to do it. You know, a cognitive system, which is increasingly important, is one that has sensors. It's sampling the world around it. Might be, you know, IoT stuff, home, home sensors, uh, measuring how many times your cat goes in and out. Or it might be uh, analytics from a web page, user clicks on different, play, different buttons and so on. Whatever these sensors are, they are measuring data. And the way we choose to measure it, the, the frequency we choose to measure it by, uh, how we choose to batch it into groups, um, how fast we choose to process it, all of these choices, these policy choices, will affect the nature of the outcome, the conclusions that we draw from those data. This is nothing new. Statisticians have known this for a long time. But we've gone from, the key transformation is we've gone from computers which were digital, and through scale, they've suddenly become statistical. I'm just going to cut it short there and say, um, Limiting our focus on small things, which is the current trend, microservices, containers, modules. Limiting our focus on small things is risky. It makes conclusions fragile, because when you have few data to build a conclusion on, any tiny variation will make a big impact on the outcome. The idea of statistics is that you take a lot of data because then small variations don't, in fact, impact the, the outcome to a large degree. It's relativity. Tiny variation relative to a big mass is stable to 747. Tiny variation relative to a tiny amount of data, a container, a microservice, is a large variation. That's a fighter jet. If you really want your containers to be doing you know, spinning like fighter jets, well, this is going to be the natural outcome of reducing systems to microservices. But we have to be very careful that we don't lose the ability to predict the very patterns that drive businesses. Because on the scale of business process, um, a container means virtually nothing. A lot of people are looking at observability as a paradigm in monitoring now. I think 
the one thing that I don't see anybody confronting is this notion of scale. You may not be able to see inside containers very well, but even if you could, you wouldn't see enough to be able to draw a conclusion. So we need to get back to a state where um, we can get hold of information, enough information to be able to see and understand a system across all of its scales. Isolation is not the point behind modularity. Uh, modularity is a cognitive tool to help us humans manage the tasks when we interact with the system. We shouldn't forget that. So we like to argue for autonomy, but autonomy right, might be you know, an, a limitation that uh, has more consequences that we care, than, we care to, uh, um, than we care to deal with. So with that, I, I don't want to say too much more because I think I've made the point, but I would love to hear any comments or questions that you guys have uh, and any of experiences that you have of this kind of problem that you've seen in your own, in your own lives. Thank you. I'm only one person, I'm very easy to sample. So if you, uh, I'm not too distributed yet. Yes, there's a question, Paul. <clears throat> Paul. So do you see any other signs of understanding and of this issue of scale in other disciplines such as biology and physics and chemistry and economics? Oh yeah, oh great question. Uh, absolutely, uh, in fact I was, um, telling some people the other day that when I got uh, interested in computer science, you know this very well, I know that you know this. But, uh, when I got interested in computer science back in 1990s, well, 1998, I wrote a paper called Computer Immunology where I made uh, a comment which is that currently stabilizing our systems is a relatively straightforward process using more or less mechanical analogies because we only have tens or hundreds of computers at a time. But in the future, when there are perhaps millions of computers, uh, we'll no longer be able to use that uh, kind of approach anymore. It'll be look much more biological. The, the upside will be that, you know, in biology you can scratch off a few skin cells and you still, you're still a human being. It doesn't affect you too much. It's resilient. But the complexity that you've added is, uh, makes us a totally different thing than a machine uh, on the scale of um, you know, some nuts and bolts. So absolutely the, the problem of scaling is inherent in all of the disciplines. Some disciplines are inherently large scale. Biology is typically something which is a large scale science. Chemistry is if the, the small scale version of that if you like where you have molecules and then there's some, some continuous uh, you know, biochemical interpolation between the two. You have, you know, scale is also not, is not necessarily distance, which is a scale. So in astronomy, you have very few things, massive distances, but few things. So now it's the counting problem is much simpler again. You know, the solar system is a relatively simple molecular almost construction. Uh, was the galaxy becomes more biological again in terms of numbers of things interacting. So this, and in, in economics, we see exactly the same thing. Uh, you go from dealing with individual payments uh, between customers, which is the real economics, and then you get to the sort of bullshit economics that uh, econ economists deal with of equilibria between smoothly varying um, economies and markets and supply and demand curves and so on, which is an utterly fictitious representation of uh, reality. And actually that's a very interesting case because we've seen how economics has failed miserably to, to, to deal with the scaling issue by oversimplifying uh, the, those small micropayments, if you like, scaling it incorrectly. <clears throat> 
So yes, uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but uh, absolutely this scaling issue exists in absolutely every field of um, everything. <laughs> every field, period. Yes, question on the right. So I was really interested in the conversation around promise and trust where I've seen, let's just say hypothetically, services that, are, that appear to be reliable uh, and a service that stays up for a while and so therefore everybody trusts it um, perhaps incorrectly. And I'm just sort of wondering how that fits into... Uh, oh, I see. Great point. <laughs> well, so theory. the way I would understand that uh, is exactly what promise is being is persistent in that case. So the promise that I am up, I'm available, the availability promise is, is kept, but maybe it doesn't keep its other promises, like maybe it uh, has a memory leak and it doesn't actually let you log in. So it doesn't keep its promise to let you log in. And then you start to measure it along these different axes. So every promise is kind of a different axis, different dimension, if you like, of the problem. And the reason I think that promises are important, more important than boundaries per se, is that they explain exactly what measuring stick or what probe are you using to sample the system? What exactly are you trying to describe about it? Back in, um, well, about 10 years ago, Jan Bergstra and I, Jan helped me write this, um, this black book on promise theory. We studied this issue of trust in relation to promises, and basically found that a, a simple definition of trust, which works quite well, is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that trust grows according to whether uh, you assess whether the promises are kept over time. And we use the term assess rather than whether the promises really are kept over time, because the perception that a promise is kept or not is also a relativistic thing, right? Depends who's looking. You can go to a restaurant, order a great meal, and, and say, is it a great meal? And one person will say, yes, this is a great meal, and the other one will say, no, it sucks. Because it depends who's looking, and what their criteria are, and what their internal uh, measuring stick is. And it's exactly the same when we measure anything. And this, is, of course, is the root of the problem behind monitoring, that when you're trying to assess whether a system is, is functioning well or not, first of all, it depends who you are. Are you an end user? Are you an end user in Norway, in America, in China, in Japan? Um, and what exactly are you doing with the system? Which promise are you relying on? Which one are you interacting with? And of course, because of our predilection for grouping things together, again, aggregating things into lumps or batches, we will often sort of dismiss all those differences, those details, into a, a summary, true, false, black, white, good, bad. And when we do that, the result becomes unstable. So the, uh, Mike's point was that it's not only the, uh, the promise, but also the assessment, which is, depends on the criteria that you use to, to assess the promise. Absolutely true. Yes. That's why, it's re that's why I say it's relativistic. Yeah. yeah. Yes. What do, you, sorry, what do you think about the future of IT, especially at scale, looking a lot more like process engineering? So if you look at, say, like an uh, oil refinery and you have pumps and heat exchangers and such as your microservices, but when you put it all together and you need to operate that system, it becomes much more empirical. It has all sorts of nonlinearities. It's changing over time as heat exchangers foul and things like this. And, and that's kind of our, our future of, of what these systems look like at scale. That's a great question. Um, and, and very pertinent to me because I just started working with a, a new company, some of my friends, um, a small company called Algebra. We're going to be looking at data processing pipelines. And of course, this is the ultimate 
um, end state of business is processes, flows of something, basically money, right? Money is the sort of the proxy for all, all things in business. But when you scale a system up to a high level, the mechanics of the system are essentially a bunch of flows, things moving around, going from some source to some outcome, you're transforming this into that, source into product, components into services. And what remains, what is invariant about that when you scale it is the storyline. So business and, and life in general is really about the stories or the pathways that we, we follow, which amount to what we mean by cause and effect, right? It's the causation, the causal part of the system is, summaries, um, is summarized by a flow of some form. And this is what really matters about the system, and this is what is measured by the, the different actors be assessing the stream. And they will assess it depending on how they perceive this, this thing. But ultimately, it's all about the storylines. All, all the rest is details. You could, you could replace, presumably, you could replace all of it if you got the same outcome. So at the high level, it's all about semantics. In other words, the story that we're telling. The dynamical part, the implementation part, the representation of those processes, whether it's an oil refinery, a data pipeline, or a queue of people going into a bank, is somewhat uh, irrelevant because there are general principles about how those kinds of flows operate. And at the highest level, that is what we are, we're kind of left with. Question, Yomar. So let me ask you about the group think in the Silicon Valley. And uh, you know, I look at this whole technology and especially the robots and the artificial intelligence, the driverless cars, as really an instrument to control people. You know, if you have driverless cars, you could simply, somebody could just sort of say, hey, you can't go someplace. Uh, if you have robots, you could enforce discipline of, or nonconformity with the established norms. Sort of like San Francisco. If you're conservative, you basically have a hard time surviving there. Uh, so uh, it just seems like the, those kind of advances uh, could well be instruments of, you know, a totalitarian country like, like uh, China. Uh, so, so what do you think, and in, 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 uh, I mean, looking 10, 20, 30 years in, into the future, uh, what's your observations on that? Great question, huge question. Um, so obviously whenever you, you introduce um, a tool or a proxy for some form of activity, it can be used for good or for, for evil or you know, for benefit or for the opposite. Exploitation, I suppose. Um, Self-driving cars could be a way to prevent people from, from being free. Depends kind of who controls, um, who controls those cars in, in some sense. I don't think there's anything intrinsically about that idea which limits the free expression. Because if you think about, well, except for scaling, so if you think about democracy, democracy is really, we say, oh, okay, we'll, we'll make a bunch of votes. Um, not everybody can decide, but we'll take the majority, and then everyone else will just have to, to like it or, or lump it. You can discuss whether or not that's fair, just, and so on and so on, but it's a process which at some level can be described as being impartial. And often it's that impartial aspect which we feel we can, if we don't trust it, then at least we accept it because, because we can't think of anything better. Of course, some people will always want to fight against it and have their own way. And then, uh, but then it's about the stability. Can we generate a set of circumstances in which enough people are happy with this system in order for it to be stable? And this is, in culturally dependent, right? So you, you mentioned the difference between East and West, the, you know, Western democracy versus China, um, the China, the party in China, 
And I find these, I travel a lot between China and, and the US, so I see those systems quite differently than I did when I was younger and had a, a sort of more cartoony understanding of it. But on the one hand, you can see that uh, China offers a huge number of services to its people that are sort of absent in the West. And at the same time, it limits them in ways, treats them like children, you could say. Um, and to some extent, they kind of go along with that because they're so used to it. They don't feel it's necessarily a limit, a limitation, unless they've seen something else. You know, it, it's all very culturally conditioned. Whereas in the West, we think it's awful, and but and we're fighting for privacy. You know, if if Google has access to my name or one picture of me, it's terrible. Some people don't want any pictures of themselves on the internet, which I find sort of bizarre because you go out in the street and people see you all the time, that's not a problem. So we're very, very uneven and uh, irrational in our, sort of in our judgments about what's right and wrong and culturally conditioned. So I, I don't think it's possible to answer that question in a simple way. I think it's a, a cultural phenomenon. Just one more question. Uh, so you talked about how the involvement of humans uh, is inherently a limiting factor because humans, we can't speed up our brains. And then you also said that um, microservices will be a t seen as a temporary aberration in the long term because there will be a language that will let us code space and time without human involvement. Can you expand on that a little bit? Like what would that look like? Hmm. Do you want me to expand in space or time? <laughs> um, so I think that right now, because we are, we are in the, at that kind of breadboard stage of wiring things together still, we don't quite know exactly how to do it in an efficient way. You know, we haven't figured out that photographic technique to do VLSI in the cloud yet. Almost, we're getting there, but you know, it's still, still a bit clunky. Uh, we're, we're still at that stage where we don't quite know what we're doing, so we are happy to wire things up manually. And this is the human journey, right? We, we get together in groups, we innovate, we make amazing things happen by getting our hands dirty. At some point, some bright spark will see that there are general things that we can do. We can write a programming language that simply treats all of these uh, composite and individual devices as a single swarm-like entity and is able to uh, pass instructions or destructions, take your pick, uh, to these devices and coordinate them in, a, in something more like a real orchestra. We talk about orchestration, but we don't really do orchestration in the sense of an orchestra in IT. But maybe we will in the future. And at that point, you know, maybe you can simply publish your score, like a composer, feed it into the cloud, and all of those microservices will be rendered, distributed, they will communicate through some kind of service mesh-like thing. Well, you'll never, ever have to code a port number. Why, why do we still have to manually set a port number? This is ridiculous, right? This is the kind of nonsense that we go through when we're still breadboarding circuitry. But it'll go away because it's nonsense and people will realize it's nonsense. But of course, along the way, we kind of believe this is the way it has to be because it's the way that it is. It takes a while for that, that thing to, sh to shift. But I totally believe that, you know, I mean, actually, you know, if you go back to the 80s and the 90s, we were much farther along in distributed operating systems than we are today. Things like um, Plan 9, of course, is the famous one, but there was Aurora and Spring OS and you know, all kinds of different fancy operating systems that totally took away this idea about where and when a program was running, just scaled it. And this is exactly what we will eventually get back to through the cloud, which is sort of the commoditized version of that. That's what I think. There's a question there. We'll take one more question after this. There's always one more. 
So I think it's interesting that you mentioned aviation as an, ex as, as an example of the Boeing 747, because my understanding is Airbus will build like, or any fly-by-wire system, three instances of the same system, maybe even implemented by different teams so that if there's a bug, there's some kind of quorum that happens. Um, do you think there will ever be a way where, a point where humans will trust whatever the magical language is that defeats space and time, will trust that enough to like build that into airplanes so that we don't have that physical separation? Do you trust Chinatown? I think this comes back to the Chinatown argument, right? So, so that Airbus, what Airbus is trying to do is they're trying to make Chinatown something crazy made of lots of different competing things all overlapping and, and somehow the consensus around it will reach some equilibrium. And hopefully that's what we trust. Versus the single, uh, single point of failure approach of a single system with a single logical controller with no redundancy, which is extremely fragile but easy to understand, which is the garden city. The thing we find, I think the thing that we find counterintuitive in the recent history of computation is that complexity can be your friend because it can bring stability if you can tame it. Can, complexity can also be chaos, of course, but, but if you can tame complexity and by you know, mixing together a whole bunch of things, aggregations, then you have built stability, and that's the thing that we trust. But because we've also had this sort of cultural aberration, if you like, this story around binary uh, tapes, you know, the Turing machine, tapes with ones and zeros, which is stripping it right down to the most compressed, uh, sim simple uh, atomic form, which is the most fragile of all cases, but it's the easiest one to understand we've begun to believe that that's the way reasoning is actually done. It's not. There is no system in the universe that really reasons in that way except our story about computers. Everything is built on scale and redundancy and stability because everything that we observe and interact with is a macroscopic, uh, you know, 10 to the 23 at least of anything involved in it. So I think, you know, we have just fooled ourselves into believing this very simplistic story around ones and zeros and gotten a bit confused about what stability really is. But now that we're going back to biological scales out of sheer necessity in order to bring computing to the masses, to embed it into the real world, we're rapidly coming back to that old story of that reality is much more complex than that. Last question. So uh, how do you think about um, system failure as, a, as system scale? In particular, what I've found is as systems, like dealing with big microservice architectures, as they get more resilient, the failure modes get weirder. And it requires more and more like human expertise to be able to diagnose and to mitigate problems. Yeah. Um. I suspect, I mean, I don't know because it depends on the system, I, I think, but, but I suspect that the reason for this is that we still build quite fragile systems. We still try to build systems into the storyline, you know, the pipeline that my friend at the back was talking about. We're trying to build that, that storyline directly out of the microservices instead of building it out of things that are more stable than that. And even when we perhaps have some elastic scaling pods and replica sets and, and so on to try to stabilize these things, the fundamental design is still fragile because it's, it's one set of semantics um, feeding into the, another one set of semantics. It's a sequence of single points of failure. Where that is, uh, where we're moving away from that is where is things like a-B testing, live testing, where you have multiple versions running alongside one another. 
which perhaps have different characteristics, different errors, if you like, different bugs, but they may behave qualitatively differently, and yet the sum of those things is, um, is more persistent, it's more stable. But then you, you also have to understand what stability means. If we probe, if we, if we understand the computer system by a single user interacting with a single instance of a service running in a cloud, that is a microscopic uh, viewpoint on the system. The, the stability of that system is a bulk property. It's what 100 users experience. The unlucky one user is always going to have some quantum experience, which, you know, half alive, half dead kind of outcome. So I think uh, we simply have to rethink our understanding of, of systems as a whole and how they scale from individual, almost like quantum fluctuations, up to those stable things that we can still talk about as being persistent. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, So in closing, just wanted to uh, make a few comments. First of all, thanks a lot to VMware for making this happen, for sponsoring the event. Uh, there are two folks in particular, uh, Elsa sitting at the way back there, as well as Kripa here with VMware Code, and they went out of their way to help uh, make this event a uh, success. And then last but not least, uh, I call him my dear friend, Mark. Uh, thank you so much. This was so illustrative and so good. Thank you so much for coming down and sharing some of your thoughts uh, here this evening with us. Thank you and good night and we'll do this again.